Hello, and welcome back to Milwaukee Records Virtual Summer Festival, brought to you by our presenting sponsor, Brady Street, the Brady Street Bid. Brady Street, of course, home to dozens of uh, wonderful bars, restaurants, shops, an iconic street of Milwaukee. Uh, has a ton of history, as we all know, and I thought, uh, what a perfect time to, to uh, get kind of a, a personal view of some of that history. So you talk about iconic Brady Street shops, and if you go back a few decades, one of the most iconic would be the Leather Shop. It used to be located at 1316 East Brady, and it was run by a fellow named Bill Odbert. Now, Bill happens to be the father of a friend of mine, Anne, and uh, her husband, Mike. Hi, Anne. Hi, Mike. And uh, hi, Rex, and hi, Alice. And Bill uh, was on Brady Street at the leather shop from about, I believe, 1968 to about 1978. And uh, incredibly, after that, he moved uh, his leather shop to the skywalk of uh, Grand Avenue. So uh, as if he couldn't be any closer to my heart, uh, I love Brady Street and I love the old Grand Avenue Mall. So this is, uh, he has a, an incredible story. And uh, so he was on Brady Street for about 10 years, uh, running his uh, leather shop. And uh, not only that, he was uh, one of the uh, original people involved in starting the uh, Brady Street Festival. So what a perfect time to kind of get some of that history. Let's, uh, let's look at a video that uh, Ann and Mike uh, put together for uh, Ann's father, Bill. Uh, this is from about 2012, and it gives us a little history about Bill and the leather shop and Brady Street and the Brady Street Festival. Then we'll come back. Uh, I'll be back here, and I'll uh, read some excerpts from a, an, an incredible uh, book that Ann put together about her, her dad, Bill, that gives us uh, even more insight into uh, Brady Street in the 60s and 70s and the beginnings of the Brady Street Festival. So, let's roll it. Ah, thank you so much for letting us use that, Anne and Mike. And thank you, Bill. Uh, what a terrific little documentary that they put together. Like I said, from about the year 2012, speaking of the year 2012, Anne put together this incredible book about her father around the same year. It's called, as you can see, it's a very large book, The Leather Craftsman, Memories, Stories, and Craft, uh, written by Bill Odbert uh, and laid out uh, by Anne, his daughter. So I thought there is a, there's a, this is an incredible book. You can't find this book anywhere. This isn't for sale or anything. It's just something that Anne put together for her father. And it's amazing. And it has a lot of, uh, it goes even deeper into the history of Brady Street, like I said, in the 60s and 70s and uh, kind of the, the beginnings of the Brady Street Festival. So I would like to read some of that book to you right now. So let's do that. A couple chapters here. The first one I'm going to read is called From Warren Avenue to Brady Street. Several of us young merchants had attended the block party on Warren Avenue that was organized by the Yippies. We saw the crowds and the excitement that formed that day and decided to have a festival on Brady Street. Being young and new to the street, we needed to enlist the older merchants to make this successful. An ally was found in Joe Gloriosa from the Gloriosa Brothers Italian Delicatessen. Joe saw the potential for promoting Brady Street, and with his blessing, we set out to create an event. A local man named Bert Stitt, who was active in the community, signed on to organize this event. Meetings among the merchants were held and ideas were exchanged. We decided on a festival that would include arts, crafts, a flea market, food, and beverage. A music venue was not included, as we felt that the music would not attract the clientele we were interested in having in our community. Plus, Summerfest was taking shape on the lakefront, and we needed the alderman and the mayor to okay the necessary street permit. I remember being in Mayor Meyer's office at City Hall as we delivered our sales pitch. The mayor looked at us as competition to the fledgling Summerfest, and even asked if we would consider holding our festival at the lakefront grounds. We stood firm as we knew the aldermen had already given their blessing. So, with some trepidation, the mayor signed off on our festival. With permits in hand, the work began. The city of Milwaukee had never seen a festival like the Brady Street Festivals of the 1970s. 
As merchants, we were able to pool some resources, advertise for artists, craftsmen, and flea market vendors. The local taverns and restaurants would supply food and beverage. The Eagle Scouts were enlisted to maintain the barricaded intersection. As dawn broke on that first festival morning, a line of cars were allowed onto the street. Displays were set up, merchandise was arranged, and hopes ran high that the festival would be successful. What fears we had were never to materialize. As the sun rose in the east, a crowd of festival goers arrived on the street. The party lasted all day until the sun set in the west. An event had just taken place that to this very day still remains as one of the most exciting and well-attended street events in Milwaukee history. How about that? I'll skip ahead here. One or two chapters. Excuse my reach. And we will go to a chapter entitled Brady Street Blooms. Things were looking up on Brady Street and for the surrounding area in the late 1960s and early 1970s. The hippies were establishing themselves as upstart businessmen and women. What started as a countercultural movement was fast becoming a part of mainstream America. Tourists or gawkers who used to ride down Brady Street with their windows rolled up to catch a glimpse of these wild-eyed, long-haired, bell-bottomed, patchouli-smelling hippies were now actually stopping and shopping. Fueled by the success of the Brady Street Festival, other small businesses were springing up. Stores like The Silver Shop, The Age of Man, Potpourri, 1812 Overture, and Joint Venture became established on Brady Street. Some of these stores became legendary and made a huge impact on the way we still live today. And I'm not just talking about scoring some incense or rolling papers, but stores that had an impact on the way we would live and shop in the future. A few blocks away from Brady Street is Kane Street. A local band of hippies known as the Kane Street Tribe had an idea for homegrown organic food. This merry band of hipsters approached several of us merchants on Brady Street for donations to help them start a small co-op. They wanted to sell organically grown produce, natural honey, seeds, beans, something called soy, and eggs from cage-free chickens. What a bizarre concept, I thought, but I decided to help them out. Several weeks later, one of the members of the KST came into my leather shop looking like a hippie farmer. He was a tall, lanky fellow with bib overalls, no shirt, and a red bandana tied around his sweat-stained forehead. From a large burlap bag, he pulled out a huge bunch of carrots. Not the carrots I was so used to see being sold in tidy little plastic bags, but carrots with the untrimmed green tops still on and a vast amount of dirt hanging from the roots. This was my payback for the money I planted with this loose group. I ate carrots for weeks. This seed money, along with the hard work and vision of the Cane Street tribe, helped establish a small co-op called the Cane Street Co-op. Before long, people from all over the community were flocking to buy their goods. After several successful years, the Cane Street tribe moved their entire operation over to Holton Street and became, wait for it, the Outpost Co-op. This new location was much bigger and business for them was booming. Eventually, they moved off of Holton Street to Capitol Drive and again renamed the store to Outpost Natural Foods. Two more stores were added, and to think, this all started with a band of hippies with a good idea. Whenever I visit one of their stores, the checkout clerk asks me if I am an owner, and I dutifully answer, why yes, and I'm a founder too. Brady Street and the hippie movement also had a large impact on the way we enjoyed music. 1812 Overture was a small record store that sprung up on Brady Street. This record store provided people with new music that radio stations weren't playing at the time. Even the way we saw music was being changed by us young entrepreneurs. A fellow named Randy McElrath formed a company he called Daydream Productions. In July of 1969, Randy and Daydream Production had a vision for a rock concert. Milwaukee and the Midwest were often overlooked by touring bands, but that was going to change. Bands were booked and a venue was selected. Merchants like myself were asked to display an announcement poster and sell tickets. The Midwest Rock Festival was held at the State Fairgrounds in West Dallas. 
A large flatbed truck was the stage, and we all sat in the bleachers of the racetrack area. Bands that played were Led Zeppelin, Blind Faith, John Mayall, and Joe Cocker. The smell of pot smoking and patchouli oil wafted through the air. During this new beginning, I wasn't totally aware that I was transitioning from a very laid-back young fellow to one that was fast becoming a fixture on both sides of the culture we were living in. I always considered myself a hippie first who just loved to be making leather goods. Making a living, making a living by doing this thing I loved was just the icing on the cake. Running a business on Brady Street allowed me to open doors to the establishment that I might not have ever had an opportunity to do before. I could now walk into tanneries, conduct my business, and receive a warm welcome and a strong handshake. Even the mayor of Milwaukee, Henry Meyer, sought out my advice on his fledgling project, Summerfest. Being a hippie also gave me credentials with the hippie movement. Hippies have always been peace-loving by nature, but when provoked by mean-spirited police, they could become violent. The water tower fountain near St. Mary's Hospital was a favorite gathering place for this fun-loving bunch of people we all knew as hippies. These gatherings were spontaneous be-ins, or happenings, that sprung up. The neighbors around the water tower were unhappy with this group, using their fountain, so the police were urged to clear out this unsavory group. One warm summer night, as the peaceful hippies gathered at the water tower, the police charged the crowd with swinging clubs as they attempted to disperse the crowd. The large group that had peacefully gathered was now being chased by the police. Most people ran away, but some ran down Farwell Avenue and eventually ended up on Brady Street. The crowd mentality took over, and many a store owner was smashed on their retreat from the pursuing police. Many a store window, I should say, was smashed on their retreat from the pursuing police. That early evening, I stood in front of my leather shop and witnessed the crowd descending on the street. Many of the established store's windows were broken. The grocery store A&P had its windows broken and food was looted. My store was not damaged, overlooked by the crowd, as I was not seen as part of the establishment. The police came by and wrapped their clubs on my concrete steps and snarled for me to get inside. It was an ugly night that would change the way us hippies were viewed by the police and the general public. In the days, weeks, months, and years to come, this event would mark a new beginning of the hippie movement in Milwaukee. At first, the news media condemned the violence, but soon saw that it was provoked by the police who started it. The police knew exactly what they wanted to do, and with forethought, they had removed their badges to prevent them from being identified. Once this revelation came to light, the news media shined a more favorable light on why the hippies acted the way they did. A young lawyer named James Woods successfully sued the city, the Milwaukee's police department, and to this day, it is illegal for any Milwaukee cop to remove their badge. A law was passed requiring police to have a badge number sewn to their uniforms, preventing them from ever again hiding who they are. Hippies had found their voice, and they were not going to take the abuse anymore. That, again, from uh, this incredible book, The Leather Craftsman, Memories, Stories, and Craft, the uh, story written by Bill Odbert, put together by his daughter, Anne. Anne, thank you so much for uh, letting me use uh, the documentary and uh, for uh, letting me borrow this book. And thank you, Bill for uh, everything you've done for Milwaukee, for uh, being, uh, you know, uh, instrumental in starting the Brady Street Festival and for all these incredible stories, which, um, of course, uh, are still very relevant to this day, as we all know. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll be right back. <laughs> 